Well, hello, hello, Beliefflings. Today's special episode release is a rare glimpse at our expansion episodes offered at Beliefhole.com. Today we present Expansion Episode 3.7, Aliens on the Playground and Schoolyard UFOs. When looking at UFO encounters and the alien presence throughout the last 100 years, a strange pattern begins to emerge. An unusually high number of daylight visitations seem to cluster around schools and playgrounds, leaving us with some of the most bizarre and confounding stories. From Superintendent Sky Cigars, to space gorilla schoolyard threats, we present true tales of the strange visitors most likely to steal your lunch money. So grab a hall pass and make a break for the exit, because when the bell rings, the invasion has begun. Hi, welcome into the hole for an expansion. Jumping off the first episode, which was hopefully a semi-coherent expose of the latest disclosure that's been going on since 2017 and onward. Yeah, that was a lot to get into. A lot to get into. I'm sorry for the acronyms, but I got this book. Where is it? Oh, he's excited. I got this book in the mail. Schoolyard UFO Encounters. This is by Preston Dennett. And this is pretty fascinating, actually. As I think I mentioned in the main episode, there's been over 100 cases, I think over 200 cases, playground encounters with either UFOs or humanoids. And this book details 100 of those encounters. Wow. So I thought it'd be fun to tell some of the stories. We've all been to school. That's true. Most of us, I would imagine. Some people are very concerned. I'm looking at the children swinging on the... (laughs) Oh uh, yeah, a weird. For today's environment video that I set on loop for us to enjoy in the background is girls swinging on monkey bars. I don't like it. <laughs> it's very odd. Okay, so fascinating book by Dennett, and he outlined some pretty interesting stories. As I was saying, we've all been to school, so I think there's some relatability to this topic. I think we can all agree that this is the best time in your life when you're, uh, you know, between five and fifteen is probably. What are you talking about? No, you disagree. The best time of your life. Chris's any nostalgic time is the best time in his life. Any other time than now. I don't know, man. 1995. I don't know. 17 was a pretty good age. Yeah, that's true. 17 was great. When you're just coming of age and but you're- there's a lot yeah, of like there's angst. A lot intense stressors and- Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Everything is too high value when you're 17. Like, this is the end of I, the world. I would not want to go back to that age right now. Would you? But John, would you want to go back yeah. to eight? No. Really? I'm just trying to get through this one, this life. Yeah. You want to get to the end, huh? I don't want to get to the end. I just, I, I have knowledge now and wisdom and I but don't- ignorance is bliss, Jonathan. Yeah, but then I have to go through the whole process What if again. you don't? What if eternity is just an eight-year-old John with Mother Janine taking care of him? <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> Chris is just like, just take care of me for the rest of my life. No, just the adventures. I feel like when you're young- The adventures. When you're allowed to have the mind of a child. The imagination. You still have the mind of a child. I do. That's why we do the show. At least that's why I do the show. Because I want to believe. I want to imagine. Anyways- <laughs> The research in here is interesting, and you would think this is something that's sort of more of a novelty. UFOs, humanoids being seen at school, Mm -hmm. right? It's not something you hear about all the time. We have these famous accounts, right? Like in Zimbabwe. Some of you out there might be familiar with. Yeah, that one's cool. That's a cool one. A lot of interviews. That one had so many witnesses, right? That was in Phenomenon, I think. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. Uh, That's one of the most well-known. I wasn't going to do Zimbabwe. That's been done to death, but in, in a good way. And we'll have some links to documentaries. There's multiple documentaries on that. Also, um... Westall. Westall. That's in uh, Clayton South. Melbourne, Australia, Outside right? Melbourne, Australia. That's a fascinating account. Mm-hmm. If we have time, we might touch on that. We'll see where we go. If not, it's something we'll be definitely doing in the future. Because this is a fascinating phenomenon. Absolutely. And that's the thing. And I, I kind of want to focus on some more unique, unknown experiences here. It's also the dream that all of us have had. Yeah. And we right? also should talk about this too, because there's so many like reasons why this could happen, especially with focusing on children, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's one of the things that Dennett briefly mentions in his book is this idea of UFO attractors. And it's something he covers in a, in a separate book, but he, but he brings it up in this book because specifically playgrounds seem to be an attraction for who or whatever these things are. Dennett brings up some interesting points related specifically to that. He says, you know, for years, researchers have been noticing a pattern. This has been going on for over 100 years at this point where these things have been seen at playgrounds. And if you do the average of numbers, it equals out to about two UFO playground encounters every year. Really? And that's if you're averaging out for like over 100 years. So that's worldwide. 
Yeah, starting with Carol and Jim Lorenzen, they founded the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, APRO, which you might have heard because you, if you ever get accounts, it's like MUFON, New Fork, that's another one like this. They realized that UFOs were strangely attracted to schools. And on a March 1966, so we're talking 60s, with no knowledge of the West Hall High School encounter, which you were just talking about in Australia, they had no idea that was about to occur, obviously, in two weeks. But Carol had written, quote, We have mentioned previously that an outstanding number of sightings of UFOs have been made in the vicinity of or over schoolyards. If the appearance of the objects over cities for long periods of time and repeatedly during the last year indicates an attempt at indoctrination, it may be that a peaceful contact may be attempted, this goes to motive, John, and that schools are being overthrown and the craft are exhibiting themselves, therefore a good reason, being that children are definitely less subject to dogmatic or preconceived notions than adults. Perhaps the visitors hope that exhibitions over various schools will influence the population to some extent. The idea basically being like, you know, if you want to have direct influence on some population of a planet, you go to the young and you go, look at me, because right. then you have some sort of influence. Or they want an unvarnished version of what human beings are. That's possible too, yeah. You know, like a unstained sort of look at human humanity. Humanity, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. To study that age group, you know. Or it's a psyop. But I think the point of these experiences at schoolyards is that they're not doing it clandestinely. They're out there in the open. So it seems like it is for them to be seen, not to necessarily study. Not to say that they're not doing that. Yeah, but how do you know that? Well, if they're out there in the open, they're not doing a very good job of like secretly what studying if, children. What if they've been studying for a long time and then part of the end study is to show themselves? That's possible. These are good questions, John. These are great questions, John. Dang. Where's your gold star? <laughs> Ding. <laughs> so it's interesting at the exact same time that the Lorenzans noticed this pattern, a pioneering researcher, Raymond Fowler, discovered the same thing. Quote, During the month of April 1996, I received a total of 22 reports that were evaluated as being in the, quote, unknown category. Six of these involved UFOs hovering over or around school buildings. Okay, and the last one I want to mention here that he mentions in the book is John Keel, who we're all familiar with, right? Ah. Mm -hmm. Mothman prophecies, et cetera, et cetera. Great Fordian researcher. In 1966, researcher John Keel was investigating and documenting a wave of sightings and unexplained events in where? Point Pleasant. Mothman. Mothman. Uh, Virginia. Like the Lorenzans and Fowler, Keel, even at this time, noticed that a large number of his cases involved schools. After investigating the case of a landed UFO, he wrote, I was perturbed to find that it was right next to the Duncan Falls Elementary School. An unusual number of sightings and 40 and events seemed to be concentrated around schools, and the largest percentage of witnesses consists of children between the ages of 7 and 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, right? And it's funny because you don't hear about this stuff a lot. What's interesting about these sightings around the schools, as opposed to like the regular average day sighting, is that they almost all occur during the day compared to nighttime sightings, which is usually the more common sighting, right? With UFOs. And that would be because school is in session, right? And the idea is if their target viewer is children, that's obviously it's going to be during the day. A good argument. But I mean, why in a random neighborhood, you don't hear a lot of accounts of a craft appearing in a neighborhood. Yeah. You know, during the day. And it goes back to your point of them wanting to be seen potentially. Right. A surprising large number of these accounts involve humanoids. That's unusual. For UFO accounts. So to actually see a creature? To actually see something exit a craft. So the fact that it's happening more often at schools when that's already a, a fraction of sightings. Um, the average UFO sighting has one to five witnesses, but at schoolyards, this typically involves a very large group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, for an encounter to have a dozen witnesses is a small amount in a schoolyard encounter. So another thing, like they want to be seen, it seems like. Yeah, the Westall, I don't know if we'll get to that one, the one that I researched for this episode, uh, it was like 300 students that were witness to this thing, chased it down into the woods. Yeah. And the cases have occurred all over the world. Obviously, United States, Australia, France, Spain, Belgium, Canada, New Zealand, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Zimbabwe, like that famous encounter, um, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, and other countries. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's been for over 166 years. Starting since the 1950s, a significant schoolyard UFO encounter has occurred, as I said earlier, an average of about one to two per year. And of course, they're still happening. So that's pretty interesting because you don't hear about them a lot. But this idea of this themed school encounter, like John said, like why, like what might the purpose be? Mm -hmm. Especially when they're mass encounters. Right. Who knows? Is it research? John mentioned earlier the idea of a PSYOP, which I think is interesting. Well, the, yeah, exactly. If you want to affect the future. Well, no, I, I, well, I was personally thinking specifically of testing some technology to fool people. 
Well, that's what a PSYOP is, right? I'm thinking earthbound. Yeah. Like maybe military. Yeah. So I'm not going to get into the famous cases right now. Um, I'll just mention, you know, we have the Australia one we mentioned earlier, Westall, Victoria, Australia. That included teachers and students, a uh, hundred or more. But Westall? Yeah. That was 300. It was, was it that many? Mm-hmm. Then you have Broadhaven, and that was in Wales, 1977. Primary school aged witnessed a silver cigar shaped object. Crestwood Elementary, that's Florida, Apalaka. You had um, 200 elementary aged school children in Florida. Have you ever heard of this? Isn't that, was that bizarre? 1967. 1967. 200 school kids witnessed this craft. Three teachers saw it as well. Another cigar shaped craft. And then finally, the one we mentioned, the Zimbabwe experience in Rua, Zimbabwe in 1994. So relatively recently, we were all in elementary school in 94. 62 primary school-aged kids witnessed two hovering UFOs in the presence of two entities that came out of the vehicles, John. And that's what you're referring to, I, I believe. And I'm pretty sure that was highlighted in that documentary where you had- Maybe I was thinking of one that was in Australia. There were no humanoids in that case. The Zimbabwe case had something dressed all in black with big black eyes. You have all these great video interviews with these yeah, children. Yeah, no, I guess the other one I was thinking about was a craft that was in the air mm-hmm. and there was beings that came out on the craft and they would like stay there for hours. I don't think that was a school one though. Yeah, Westall wasn't that long. It was in like Guatemala or something. Okay. And some gathering of people and this craft came down and stayed in the air forever and the Humanoid beings came out on the craft and just stayed there for That's a long time. Crazy, bizarre. Yeah. I know the Australian one in uh, Westall that was like a half an hour long, but I don't think there were any. In that case, there weren't any. Yeah, people. I was thinking about the the Zimbabwe one was where it looked like they were wearing like a wetsuit or something. Yeah, that's yeah. Zimbabwe. One of the creatures was described as having an all black suit or like black clammy skin, big black eyes, the typical eyes. Uh, one student though said the one on top had long black hair, long black it kind of kind of fat but he said he looked like a hippie <laughs> like long oh hair my God, really yeah well they said that they were telepathically communicating with them saying like your earth is in trouble sort right of thing that was the message so maybe it was a fat hippie yeah, from that's the future what it looks like dude <laughs> could be who came hilarious. back and was like hey man you guys are destroying the planet <laughs> yeah and if we ever do i mean part of me i was torn because i kind of wanted to cover those because there's such good audio testimony in that but i figured that's one that anybody can look up it's pretty pretty available so i want to do some more unique stories with some interesting aspects that you don't hear about a lot so that's what we have coming up here let's take a quick break first okay Testing one, two, three. Hello. We're back. We are back and so are the aliens. Or inner earth people. Yeah. Aliens, maybe, maybe inner earth, maybe uh, government. A lot of this is military. Oh, I'm sure absolutely. I mean, you look at like all the experiences people have. Where did they get their technology from though? Reverse engineering, bro. Breakaway civilization. From the aliens? Well, yeah. No, no. Hold on. Hold I think on. so. How come we had such a big jump? That's my big question about the whole thing. Like that kind of out of anything proves like there might be something else because it was like, unless there's just a natural exponential growth, but we went for like thousands of years just inching along and then like the 40s and 50s come and it's just like- Well, it depends. And that's a good question. It depends. I mean, you can, first of all, let me just say that the breakaway civilization idea, right? That there has been since the 40s with the Nazis using occult research and communications with supposedly entities from the other side. Whoa, right? what are you talking about? Uh-huh. This is a fascinating concept. Um, Why don't we do that for the expansion? We have many expansions <laughs> that we can do, John. And I think what's fascinating is the occult connection with the Nazis, their, their fascination with occult, not only magic. I didn't know that, really? Yeah, dude. Really? They believed in the, what we covered in our, our um, Hollow Earth episode, that their attempt, alleged attempt to find Shambhala, the inner earth, they believed that the Aryan race was an ancient race of advanced mm-hmm. beings. So it ties into all this, but there's some fascinating connections. When it comes to advanced technology, we talk about craft that are seen. I think a lot of these that pop up, I continue to think possibly these are a breakaway civilization from, if you want to call it the Fourth Reich, some Nazi outpost that exists in Antarctica. There's evidence that they went there after World yeah, War it, II. Yeah, it sounds crazy. But they we, were developing UFOs. Sorry, go ahead. It sounds crazy, but we did a little bit of Admiral Byrd stuff 
if you remember him from our Inner Earth episode uh-huh. we did. The Flugelrads. The Flugelrads. But that was outside of Admiral Byrd. That was someone else who had his experience in there. It was an alleged journal from Admiral Diary, Byrd. We yeah. talked about the Flugelrads and he talked to these people in the Inner Earth. But the facts that we know about Admiral Byrd's expedition up there, or down there rather, was that there were hundreds of military personnel armed and you had aircraft carriers, you had aircraft all going down for a, quote, scientific mission. When we know, and there were, there were documents stating that there were people in Hitler's administration, if you want to call it that, that openly talked about how they were making a... New Schwabenland. A new Schwabenland. They were making a paradise for Hitler. In Antarctica. They had a compound that was safe from enemy incursion in Antarctica. These were statements at least made by the higher up Nazi generals. So Admiral Byrd goes down there and it's supposed to be a scientific expedition, but it includes like some, like, I don't know, 15 destroyers, 400 armed servicemen. The storyline has been that it's, it was just for scientific purposes, just to explore. And then they lose two planes. Supposedly there was some conflict and they ended up retreating. And the idea is the Nazis, after losing the war, maybe Hitler faked his own death, maybe not, but they went to Antarctica and started a basically a new civilization that, that used the uh, technology and possibly connections with people from the inner earth, ancient advanced technologies, who knows? But they were testing UFO craft. They were testing flying saucer. You can see photos now that, on the record that are Nazi swastikas. Right. Some are Photoshop, but some are real. And the question is, are some of the stuff that we're seeing now, some of the Nordics that people have seen, maybe there is some ancient Nordic race that, you know, maybe they weren't actually aligned with the Nazis, maybe they were, whatever, but maybe there was some reality so I think that. we got to come to that. And first of all, I know it sounds crazy, like the Antarctic Nazi thing, like there's sci-fi movies that are made about it. It's this, because right. it sounds so out there, but at the same time, there is actual historical truth to it. That's not classified anymore. But we started off with the occult part of it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to, first of all. How did they, how did the 1940s Nazi Germany get this technology? Unless there was some breakthrough. Right, so here's one of the questions too. And the reason I brought up the occult thing, John, is because the occult aspect, that's always been fascinating to me as far as the advancement of technology. Because not only the Nazi connection with their interest in the occult and uh, the Vril, but also this, this point always stuck out to me. And I'd like to try to find more information on this, but the television, right? Which washes all of our brains. Television. Television. On a daily basis, <laughs> like this creates your reality. Now it's more YouTube, the internet, whatever you pay attention to, but for, for a lot of people, the it's screen, still- The screen, basically. It's the screen. It's your iPhone. Right. And it, it, this all came from television, right? Network TV. Right. And from what I remember reading, and I'd love to do an episode on this, if you guys out there know more, tell me, but the guy who was developing the television, who invented, I think it's the cathode the ray- The cathode ray tube. Right. He was trying to- communicate with the other side oh really i think i've heard that before too yeah john your your words sound very i have a thing in my mouth i do <laughs> very chewy I have a pretzel rod <laughs> sorry i will swallow that so it's kind of an interesting concept the idea that like you're trying to communicate with the other side and you stumble upon the technology for television or there's like a spirit box exactly maybe there i like to think i guess maybe i don't i don't like to think it but it, i'm intrigued by the possibility that the cathode ray tube and the television was born out of this communication with the other side and there is a kind of energetic spiritual aspect to the television that maybe humans aren't really designed why to why do you to like have. to think that i, I mean I, I i'm intrigued by it is what i say yeah he's intrigued i'm intrigued because i think that's an interesting idea the fact that like you know it creates our reality and if you somewhere in the middle of developing a technology, but then launching forward into this technology that allows us to send images to Think each other. Think about how much that's changed humanity. The screen. Absolutely. Yeah. The projection of information. It just reminds me of like an intellectual ventilator. You just sit there, you get something plugged the in. Trance, and you just, dude. Imagine like if you just erased televisions from rooms or phones from hands and you just have someone standing there or sitting there for hours on end looking and being immobile. Creepy. Go ahead. Here's the spooky sign of it. This is the spooky thing to me, is that you have poltergeist, right? The famous image of the girl sitting in front of the screen, the, the ghost They're coming out of the screen. Here. Exactly. And you have uh, the idea of the white noise. What if the guy who was developing the cathode ray tube to reach beyond, uh, he created the television, found that technology, made it work. But at the same time, maybe he partially achieved what he was trying to do. And maybe there is a kind of otherworldly energy that comes through the television. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, Especially yeah. the internet, the World Wide Web. Oh, Ghost in the Machine, man. I mean, it just seems like it's starting to take on a life of its own. TV was one thing, but the... We live at least half the time there. But hey, schoolyard uh, UFO encounters, right? <laughs> Are we going to cover any of those today? Yeah, so speaking of getting back into our reality, let's look a little deeper into what's going on. Because as we're looking down at our phones, things are looking down on us. And we're oblivious. Ooh, like ants. Exactly. Let's do our first story. 
Okay, so the first story I wanted to get to, it just relates to the first episode we did, so I thought it would be interesting to do. <gasps> Pyramids? As Yes, as I was looking through this book, I was like, is there a pyramid account in here? And there was. Yes! One. Oh. But it's kind of a twofer. This comes from two separate accounts that Preston Dennett discovered on New Fork takes place in the Bronx. At Public Elementary School 54, I call this Pyramids in the Park. An incredible school encounter occurred in May 1970 at the Public elementary school number 54 in the Bronx in New York City. One of the students, Antonio, recalls what happened. At around lunchtime, I and hundreds of other students and some of the school faculty saw a silver-colored object shaped like a pyramid. Here it is. About a hundred feet up in the air above the schoolyard, spinning in place. I'd say the object was the size of a small school bus. Side so note, that's so crazy, man. Because that's in our first stories we covered. Sheet metal, exactly. silver, reflecting sunlight, and spinning. It's exactly. So, so we'll weird. get wait till the next part. Okay, yeah. Antonio was impressed by the way the sun reflected off its surface. He was surprised when the assistant principal who stood next to him mentioned the word UFO. That is a GD UFO. This was the first time he had heard of such things, and now he was seeing one. Shortly after the object appeared, a helicopter arrived and began to circle around the object. Antonio watched the incredible sight until the lunch bell rang, and he and the other students had to go back inside. All right, kids, it's just a pyramid craft from an advanced alien civilization. We got pizza bobs and turkey gravy inside, and it's getting cold. Aww. Years later, Antonio still recalled the incident. He has searched for any corroboration of the incident, but has come up empty-handed. It's as if I was the only one to watch this phenomenon, but there were at least 50 eyewitnesses. The school's vice principal also witnessed it, along with other staff members. This needs to be followed up. There cannot be an unconfirmed UFO report when there are scores of people who witnessed it. The same evening, the object returned over another Bronx school. I was playing at the public school, 154 Play Yard, says the anonymous student. All of a sudden, the pitcher, Eddie Rodriguez, looks up and continues to stare at the sky. All the players look up, and there were two moons. The moon that wasn't supposed to be there released a smaller object and soon overshadowed the original. It was very large in the sky. It looked like it was alive and about to fall on the ball field. My friend, Eladio Alvarez, said, Run! It's gonna fall! Eddie and I couldn't believe our eyes. This thing was going to crush the park and everyone in it. Over 150 people started running for their lives. As I watched this thing get massive over the park, it disintegrated to the sides and disappeared. I've never seen anything like it. Many people saw this. I just happened to be in the South Bronx play yard of public school, number 154. That's creepy. So I just wanted to bring that story in because it was the pyramid connection of what's going on right now with these pyramid sightings. It seems to be a sort of new phenomenon, but. Maybe only publicly now are we seeing images of something that's probably been here for a long time. Or publicly confirmed, yeah. Acknowledged, yeah. What if this whole point of existence to now is just this, like, dream state of human beings where, like, back in time, like, we had these connections with other terrestrials, other parts of the universe. We've been in this dormant phase for a really long time to sort of develop in an experimental lab. Oh, to, like, remember where we came from? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know about that. Maybe. I feel like... Humanity has been on this ever deepening sleep into materialism mm -hmm. and just, you know, for a long time over the past couple hundred years, it seems like we're going deeper into this sleep state. Right. You know, we're just obsessed with materialism. It's very difficult to get science to even acknowledge anything outside of this three-dimensional world. 
But what if the reality is obviously that there's just this much grander yeah, thing? A cornucopia of right. life forms and life form and universe and all right. sorts of things. Interdimensionality. And yeah. I think on some level there is an awakening, even in scientific community, yeah. where this is a, a possibility. And I, and I think you're right though. I think what it used to be was we had a broader vision because we allowed mythology, spirituality. We could see stars. Yeah, or even just that. We could see stars. We didn't have this light pollution. Religion and tradition and myth allowed us to believe in the supernatural. And now we've eradicated that to a certain extent. You can see the last vestiges of spirituality, supernaturalism, I guess if you don't use it as a term, in the beginnings of you know Victorian science and medicine, as that starts to advance, we start to lose a lot of the superstition, the supernatural, what you'd call superstition. But it used to be more of like an intermixed kind of thing. And I, right. I can't help but think ancient civilizations had more of a mixture as we're seeing yeah. the things that they were able to develop. We could see the technology that they had, or at least evidence of technology that they had. It seems to be an intermix of spirituality and a materialistic and that's value. That's where of the I world. think we're really going wrong right now. Right. When you go to a high technological place, I think there's an incredible danger if you don't balance it with wisdom and understanding. Yeah. We're just not, as a whole, caring about any of that stuff. Yeah, at all. and you and you have to look at science in the same vein as the generation or the decades that are running parallel to the development of that science where our culture is, mm -hmm. is going to inform on some level, the, the direction of the scientific inquiry that we're investing yeah, in. Quick, Does that make sense? Quick anecdote about what you're talking about. Remember Percellus? Mm -hmm. The gnome guy. Refresh my memory. He was an alchemist, scientist, theologian. He coined the term gnome in, a, in his book on gnome salamanders and something else, but he was a scientist at the time. And he believed in the Tommy knockers, right? Warning miners of impending doom. But he's also the reason that we are safe from infection. Isn't that crazy? He's the one that realized that like if we, let's see, he demanded the application of cow dung, feathers and other noxious concoctions to wounds to be surrendered in favor of keeping the wounds clean. Oh, uh, instead of rubbing cow dung into your wound? He said, quote, if you prevent infection, nature will heal the wound by herself. Oh. That's where that started. And he also, and he was an alchemist. And alchemy goes way beyond turning lead to gold, obviously. For right. a lot of people listen, they know. It's a spiritual metaphysical concept that has to do with the great work. And that's a whole other topic, but it's stuff that just gets cut from science. It cuts from the dialogue of what science used to be anyway, that there is this reality to existence that could be explored, but it's not, it's not material. Well, and I think there are some that are waking up to that idea that like you move too far in one direction within the scientific community or in scientific investigation, you start to realize that you're doing a, a sort of circling back to some things that used to discount as superstition when now we're finding there are just explanations we were unaware of yet. Yeah. That explains these things. Sort of like what seems like magic one generation ago is just science explained in a different way. Exactly. Let's get into some more stories, Chris. All right. This one's short and quick. And I only brought this in because this happened in Westerville, Ohio, which we spent a year and Uncle John lived in for many years. I delivered pizzas there for a year. Rest in peace, Uncle I John. I served coffee in there for a year. Yeah. But and I met a beautiful girl. I had more adventures because I... She's now married to someone else. All because right. Because you walked away. I thought she deserved... This that. is a segment <laughs> called Chris's Regrets. <laughs> beautiful town, by the way. If you've never been there. Right outside of Columbus. So this happened at Shawnee Middle School in Westerville, Ohio. And I call this, What Do Rockets Wake? I don't understand that sentence. What do they weigh? What do they wake? Like, wake up. Well, you'll see when you hear the story. Okay, it's, only, okay. it's really short. Oh, no, I get it. Like, they wake up aliens. In May of 1981, a student at Shawnee Middle School in Westerville, Ohio, had a remarkable sighting with his principal while on the school playground. The student had just completed participating in a model rocket contest at the school. It was around noon, and he and the principal were the last ones on the playground. They were just about to enter inside the school when he saw a, quote, large black 55-gallon drum-looking UFO hovering overhead. It rotated very slowly and had no markings. The student alerted the principal, quote, We both stopped and observed for around five minutes before he sent me in. He stayed to observe, but I never spoke about it with him after that. I thought this one was cool. It's, it's an interesting story because the idea of like, you're walking inside, you look up and you see this black object just floating silently above you and your principal. Yeah. And you're both staring at it and he's like, going in to me. <laughs> and you go inside and then he's out there for a while. And then he comes in and he never says anything to you. and never talk about it. And I want to know, was he replaced? That would be my first thought. Yeah. Pod principal. Just a, a haunting image of this thing floating in the sky. Anyway, that was a quick short one. The next one is exciting. Very exciting. 
Is this space gorilla versus cow? Yes. <laughs> so let's get into it. You guys ready? I'm ready. All right. You guys both have parts in this one. In March of 1966, Melody Korn was 10 years old. She attended fourth grade at Point Elementary School in St. Louis, Missouri. The school was along Edgemont Road in a rural area filled with grassy fields and groves of trees. Just behind the school, there was a farm bordered by a white picket fence. A small group of cows grazed there and were visible from the edge of the school grounds. For Melody, the highlight of each day was, of course, recess. On this particular day, however, recess would change her life. Normally, Melody would join her friends and play foursquare with a bouncing ball. On this day, they decided to play tag. While most of the kids stayed closer to the school, Melody and five other kids moved over to the school ball field. Melody saw them first right on the baseball diamond area, a weird set of footprints. Whatever made them, it walked on two feet. I remember looking down and I saw strange footprints, like they were small. It had a heel, but the toes came to a point. They looked like bare feet, but it was rounded where the heel was. Then it got wider, but with pointy toes. I called my friends over. Hey guys, you gotta see this. Look at that footprint. What do you think it could be? Nobody had any answers. We were all scratching our heads, Melody said. We didn't know what kind of animal that could be. We didn't know. Hmm. However, as we were examining the footprints, we noticed flashing lights in the area of the farmland beyond the ball fence. Since the teacher was not looking, we sneaked past the baseball court onto the private property. The lights were bright, brilliant and white. At first, I remember thinking it was an ice cream truck. We saw flashing lights, and I remember being 10 years old. We thought, oh my gosh, there's an ice cream truck down there. <laughs> How did an ice cream truck get back there? But there was no noise, just flashing lights. So we thought, let's go down there and check it out. Well, it was beyond school property. That didn't stop us. We, the six of us, went down past the school property, and as we approached closer, we saw a silver spaceship type of thing with white lights going around the top, but yet no noise, no music. We immediately realized it was not an ice cream truck, <laughs> but we didn't know what it was. We saw a gray-like saucer-shaped object with lights going around the top. It was aluminum looking, not big, rather small actually. At this time, we noticed a four-foot-tall thing. I don't know what you'd call it. It was like a dark gray or charcoal color with very rough skin, long arms. The head was rather large, but round. And I do remember extremely large eyes, but I cannot remember what color they were. No clothes that I could tell of any sort. Just a dark-colored, rough-skinned body. Rough, dark, gray skin long arms, big eyes, and it seemed to have something in its right hand. Melody didn't see what was in its hand. She was more struck by the humanoid's strange appearance. It had a bulky, muscular body, almost like a gymnast. The arms were very long, and the head was oversized and bald. She couldn't tell if the figure was male or female. In some ways, it reminded her of a gorilla, except it wasn't hunched over, and it walked upright. There were six of us. The little figures stood there looking at the six of us. Three boys, two other girls, and myself. None of us moved because I believe we were in shock at what we were seeing. We're all standing there in a row, staring at this thing, and it was staring back at us. And as it looked at us, it started walking to its right. Okay, this part's great. I just wanted, I wrote that because I just I wanted to say this part's awesome. The small figure began moving toward a white picket fence where there were four cows, but never took its eyes off of us. We never said a word. We just stood there in shock. One cow was close to the fence, and as it walked over there, never taking its eyes off of us, it went up to where there was a cow on the other side of the fence. And then it touched this cow. The small figure touched this cow. This particular cow fell over immediately. It just fell. 
At this point, our teacher, Miss Ollendorf, noticed that we were beyond our recess boundary <gasps> and then noticed what we were all looking at. <gasps> she became hysterical, began screaming, Children, move away from the monster. and rounded Children, us up to get into the school. The she made us all go to our rooms. Melody wanted to stay and keep watching, but had no choice. Back in the classroom, she and the other students who had seen the UFO and the humanoid began talking excitedly about what they had seen. Soon the whole class heard. Miss Ollendorf was in a complete panic. I think she was afraid. She really panicked badly. She was extremely hysterical. While the students immediately rushed to the windows to see the UFO, Miss Ollendorf began closing the blinds, trying to block the students' view. There was about 25 students in the class. Most of them busily began jumping up, lifting the blinds, trying to get a glimpse of the weird craft among the trees, says Melody. Of course, we were peeking behind the shades to get a glimpse of what we could see. All of us were trying to look out the window, and we could still see the spaceship down there. The little being was no longer visible. Miss Ollendorf called for the principal, Mr. Norris. Soon, some of the other teachers became involved. The next thing I remember, we are all lining up at the buses to go home. Which, as I got older, I thought, that's strange. It wasn't time to go home. Years later, she still remembers the names of the other five children who witnessed the spaceship and the humanoid. And she is still in touch with the three of them. For many years, I often thought of this incident and still remember it very well. The four of us still talk about it amongst ourselves. But they, like me, for many years, never said anything to people because people look at you sideways when you tell a story like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What? What, what happened to that cow? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I, I want wanna... to know what happened to the cow. I don't know if if you got that while you're reading. It's kind of hard to follow along no, with. I followed it. So it's like, there's this, I love this visual of this weird looking gorilla like guy. And he's like, he sees the kids and he makes eye contact with them. And he's not looking away, and he's just kind of slowly like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And he <laughs> just touches the cow, strange. and the cow collapses. <laughs> Sounds like a creepy threat, in a way. Yeah. yeah, it definitely is not, like, but they kids didn't seem to be scared of it. I mean, the teacher freaked out. Yeah. You know, Chris, I was skeptical, because I, I was concerned if we weren't covering the two major stories we've always heard of, the Australian story and the uh, Zimbabwe. How good can these other stories be? But, I mean, this story, there's so many good ones out there. This story is, I mean, the, just the fact that it has a humanoid creature and it has some sort of other earthly supernatural ability. Yeah, these are beyond, I mean, the story that I had prepared to cover, which we might still do another episode um, because it's interesting, doesn't doesn't come close to this as far as like the the supernatural implications, the, you know, the crinkly bags that can be picked from (laughs) for snacks. (laughs) No, you're right. And the, the Australian encounter, there weren't any humanoids. I wanted to grab, and the cool thing about this book, half of the book is on humanoid encounters. Well, obviously we're not going to do all those today. This book will be in the show notes, guys. It will. And um, the other thing I love about this book is that he sources everything in the back, which that's is, cool. you know, I mean, we've talked about this before, but that's such an important thing to have sources on where you're getting information, where you're getting stories. Even if they're just MUFON accounts, New Fork, that's still someone submitting their own story. It's not complete creepypasta. Confabulation or... Yeah. And I will say when I, when I collected the accounts for the first episode of the Pyramid stories mm-hmm. um, from New Fork and MUFON... I didn't get to all of them, so we'll have them in the show notes, but at least one of them said most likely a hoax in parentheses. So even ones that are submitted that are so outlandish or maybe they contact the person and it just seemed like it was fake, those notes are in those new fork. Right. So it's not just completely like whatever. Well, it sounds like there's even the person that's reporting it is saying like this could have been right. Exactly. Contrived. Yeah. Yes, John. Yeah, yeah, I have a thought. So, you know, we talk a lot about what is this phenomenon? It could be government tech. But like when you involve the humanoids in it, right? my question is, could it still be government tech or could Mm. it still be? Yeah. That's the question. That would be when it comes to the idea of the psychological, what kind of imagery can be potentially placed in a person's mind? Or could it be technology? Oh, like like holographic technology? Android. Or Android. That's interesting. Like actual Android. I like that's some lo-fi 80s tech. That's kind of cool. What do you mean lo-fi 80s? (laughs) Just like a short circuit deal? You never hear about that tech anymore so much. I guess we get the DARPA robots and stuff, but in popular sci-fi, we've moved away from like, you know, the androids from Alien and stuff where we've moved now into like everything's digital, but it's a cool concept because of course, yeah, DARPA's still working on robotics. They're still working on- Yeah, and I'm just saying, if you think about the black projects, the things that we don't know about that are supposedly 50 years ahead, 
I mean, this is wild speculation. I just, I'm wondering, you know, I've gone all over the board in recent memory of what it could be. And yeah. I just feel like more of it to me could be government technology. Like mm -hmm. I was dead set it was aliens for sure. When I first started getting into this stuff, I was a hundred percent certain. I mean, that was my gut instinct. And over time I was like, well, it definitely could be like government advanced technology, yeah. right. other governments technology. For sure. It's hard to imagine that all these accounts, I think to put anything in one box is a bad Is it move. a mistake? It's a mistake. <laughs> I think it's to say problematic. like, whether it's like government or it's all aliens, that I feel like is someone is trying to put everything into one box because they want a certain perspective to be the right perspective. Right. But it could be. Sure, it could be, but it's very hard to believe that every experience people have in all abduction scenarios, all humanoid encounters, all of it's just... I don't think John's suggesting all, that all of them are. I'm certainly not. I'm just saying, right. is it possible that these humanoid Some, encounters could be still government I think it's related. a possibility. I think when the humanoid encounters come into play, it's definitely a possibility. I think it's less likely than yeah. some of the other experiences I would say where you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. But it is possible. And I think it brings up an interesting what is conversation. It? What if it is humans from the future that are coming back? That's, That's a yeah, classic theory. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. talked about this before, the idea of like, especially when you have like the grays, right? You've got these spindly looking yeah. guys with pot bellies and big eyes. Well, if you're you know, sitting at home Netflix and chilling and you're eating food all day. See, I've heard delivery. that the greys are government Robo technology well, I, before. See, I mean, there's so many theories out there. I've also heard I that, mean, I'm just, yeah, right. I, I have think no the, idea, per but. the purveying theory is that, no. and even if you hear, like, for example, Travis Walton story, which we've never covered in depth, we've mentioned on other episodes. Is that the fire in the sky guy? Exactly, fire in the sky. Rogan. Yeah, uh, but his experience was basically like when he encountered what you could kind of describe as greys, Basically, when he interacted with them, they reacted very robotically. You know, he freaks out and he, he hits one of them, punches one and pushes one of them, and it falls backward into the other one. Mm -hmm. In the movie, they show it react and start fighting him a little bit. But in reality, in his story, Almost like a, like it just a fell robot. down. Like mom, it, was, mom, mom. it wasn't designed to face adversity, physical or adversity. Anything outside of its programming. Exactly. That could be just a species if it doesn't ever fight or anything. It's right. all technolo like very high technology, right. very little physicality anymore yeah. it's all brain function it's all even consciousness based they just don't interact physically they're not a very physical being anymore that would make sense why you would let's say this was a living life form when you come down and you abduct people you have you know almost every account is i was immobilized right i was because they can't float it up they're not very good at confrontation right so you would want your subject to be completely immobile their brains are huge well their heads are big that's what i'm saying yeah mostly empty space but no, to your point, I think that it's definitely a possibility. What but do you think it is? In my opinion, from looking at so many accounts, there are certain situations where if I could believe in anything absolutely in regards to this phenomenon, there are absolutely cases where there are things that are not earth bound or that are not human in nature or origin. What do you human. think they are? I think it's a mix of extra dimensional, extraterrestrial, probably extraterrestrial. And definitely there are government operations. Where are they from? Anywhere. Well, this is the other thing. Like, I know we talk a lot about interdimensionality as a possibility or inner earth. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, and you hear this theory a lot, it's not a new theory, but if you have something that's that advanced that could travel that far, like let's say there's something that's, you know, millions of years further along than we are, at least as far as technological development, to think that you have to follow along the same concepts of physics and the physicality of the world we live in, that seems crazy to me. That if you're that far advanced, you've probably figured out things that we're we're so blind to right now. That I think we talked about earlier would explain a lot of paranormal things, things like even consciousness. Instant transportation. Instant, yeah. For example, Stephen Greer, we didn't bring him up in this previous episode, but you know, his whole thing is they're good, yada yada. But he also thinks that if you have travel like this and you have a lot of this technology, once you get into the realm of consciousness and you start to understand consciousness and become evolved in that way, things like traveling somewhere in an instant. The world is mapped to consciousness when you get to right. that level of understanding, which I think is a total like possibility. He, you put a key into the door and just opens up exactly. like all the physical limitations. Right. So to have skeptics to say, well, like, you can't travel that far because right. it's so far. It's just like opening up another level. Like if it was a video game, you get new powers, but it's really nothing has changed. You just see it in a way that allows you to more fully understand it. Exactly. Hey everybody, we're taking a quick break and I just wanted to let you know that on this week's expansion, we are going to be covering the near-death experience, one of my personal favorites, a mystical and magical event that happens to some people when they come very close to death. And we're going to be interviewing one of these experiencers in an upcoming episode and we just wanted to give people a little bit of a taste of how some of these experiences can happen. 
Although we do a great job, I think, on this episode, kind of telling some other people's stories, there's really nothing like it when someone actually that experienced one of these events describes in detail what happened to them. So look forward to that. But until then, if you're interested in this topic, definitely head over to bleafhole.com and hit the expansion button. And here's a little preview of what is to come. I had my first near-death experience when I was a child, perhaps two or three. This would be about 1953. It involved me drowning. My memories of it were seeing my body below me. I remember seeing a bright, warm, loving orb above me. I saw my dad and mom panicking below. I didn't know this experience was anything to talk about and no one would have believed me. It never was a thing I felt I had to relate. Then in 1971, I had been knifed with a stiletto. What's a st- Isn't that a, a heel? A high heel. Yeah. How do you get a knife with a stiletto? They're sharp. What kind of life was he living with? Is he hurting prostitutes? <laughs> yeah, I think he was smuggling cocaine at a club. That's a weird That's thing strange. to be knifed by. Awful though. Okay, so a knife by a stiletto that had severed an artery above my liver. I remember looking up and seeing a light. I then looked down at my body and then I was confronted by at least two beings. They were human in appearance and they seemed to float in midair. That's another theme, by the way. Mm -hmm. I realized it was far above my body and not in any earthly space. The beings tried to keep me from going to the light. I don't know why. They just seemed terrified and didn't want me to go. That's interesting. But I did. I shot up like an arrow through what can only be described as a tunnel. I saw the tunnel as a peripheral blur of stars and I saw a loving light before me. Then I stopped. I was there with this orb of glowing love and understanding. It didn't seem foreign to me. It was not frightening. It was totally assuring and there was no feeling of anything but my awe and the love and knowledge and wisdom this orb projected. In size, it would be not like looking at the sun, but looking at the earth when you were on it. It was immense and total, and its power was love. I felt a presence next to me, a man, and he asked if I was ready for my life review. Are you ready to review your life? And now, back to the main episode. And to that point, if you guys are ready for one more story, it gets into a little bit of the physicality of this other intervening entity or entities or intelligence or maybe our own experiments, but it talks about the physicality of the nature of this travel. So if you want to do that story. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to mention one thing about these entities, like in the Travis Walton story where it seemed robotic, like the idea that could be military tech, these android grays, right? Uh, In the movie Oblivion, which by the way, excellent film. Great movie. The Pyramid in the sky was called the Tet. And, yeah. and in the in the movie, the idea was that this was giving energy to the people that remained orbiting the Earth, Tom Cruise and his partner. And okay, spoiler alert, put your earphones on if you haven't seen this movie. Yeah, don't let Jeremy spoil it for you because it's a fantastic movie. I don't film. think this is a big spoiler because the movie's great. But at the end, Tom gets into the ship and it's very empty inside. There's no creatures uh-huh. to fight, right? And when he finds the main command center, it's very mechanic. You hear the digital voice very alien sounding. Just AI? It's AI. And the reason that that was, and this reminds me of the idea of Grey's- not AI from this planet. The reason that was, and the reason that I thought of this when we talked about Grey's being telecommunication androids or whatever, AI androids, the director of the film or the creator had spent some time with some scientists at the time who were theorizing about extraterrestrial life. And they were saying, if they were going to come here, there's a very strong possibility that depending on what, where their civilization was at, that they would be sending a drone. Like Borgs, yeah. Exactly. And mm-hmm. they would be controlling it either telekinetically or however. That's a very real possibility. From a mm-hmm. distance. So if you if you entered one of those crafts, there would be no creatures. Right. It would just be a hollow oh, it just makes sense. AI. In my mind, for some reason, that seems like the most likely scenario. Well, yeah, and there, there's so many accounts of the greys and interaction with the greys and a human, right. like an account of the, the third kind or whatever, an abduction, where you have the greys there initially, but then there is something else, whether it's a reptilian right. or a shadow person or a Pleiadian or something, some blonde hippie looking the guy. Greys. But usually they're accompanied, often they are anyway, they're the only race that I've heard of that's accompanied with 
another race. Like there always seems to be somebody else kind of behind the but scenes. But yeah, it's interesting. There. Like it just reminds me of sending a drone out, you know, mm-hmm. they just happen to be in like kind of a humanoid form for whatever reason. Maybe that's just the way it, robots are designed. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what it is. Maybe the robots are designed for <laughs> a close approximation of what they would experience here. I mean, who knows? But yeah. right. They just, to me, the, the grays just don't seem alive in some ways. They send information from their eyeballs, it seems like, a lot mm-hmm. of times. But, yeah. But where does that come from? Right. Is, is that from the entity there? Or it's is just it from They something... don't seem to have a lot of life for as advanced as they are. They don't. How does a civilization like that sort of inanimate build right. like crazy well, spaceships? You, you could argue, and, but I think you're, I mean, I, I tend to lean more towards the robotic idea. But you could also think like if something advances to the point where like it doesn't need to communicate with physical cues or with any sort of expression. I would hate for us to ever get to that point. You can imagine with enough mind to technology, yeah, eventually robots. you don't need to like, you know, smile or... But I also think like in the accounts, there are a lot of, they're like grays floating, right? Sometimes through walls, not mm-hmm. moving much. You don't hear about like grays like, oh, one pulled its back out or it's stretching or making, you know, grumbling about, you know... <laughs> stretching not, its calf muscles. It was muscles. to l- work late that day. Like there's no humanity. Or organicness. Exactly. I do, I do a great story we're going to do about a certain ranch coming up, not Skinwalker, a different one, but where there is... Uh, what is it called? Stardust Ranch. Really, really good book. Actually, we will do an episode on it. But there is one scene with involving a samurai assassination of a gray. Mm, really? Yeah. What? Samurai sword. Is there blood? You will find out when we do the well, episode. Well, that would be helpful to know what the answer is. Exactly. So <laughs> hang on for that. I'm looking forward um, to that. Cliffhanger. Do you guys want to do one more story? Sure. All right. Well, to take it back in, and this maybe could give us a little more speculation about what these things are. Not that all these things are the same, obviously, but let's do this one. And I had some corroborating accounts that relate to this, but we can save this for another day. Is this from Ohio too? Yes. This one takes us back to Ohio again. <gasps> this comes from Jerome Elementary in Marysville, Ohio. Where's Marysville? Northwest of Columbus, just a bit. Okay. They're pretty close to Westerville, actually. Uh, I call this, it wraps the world in its web. And John, would you begin? October 22, 1954 was a lucky day for the students at Jerome Elementary School in Marysville, Ohio. Due to good behavior, the students had been granted an extra recess. One of the teachers, Mrs. Dittmer, says, It was one of those glorious warm fall days, and the sky was clear blue. There were about 60 students outside at around 3.15 p.m. The students suddenly noticed a strange object hovering over the school. The object was cigar-shaped, but had no wings or tail. It was brilliantly lit. So bright, in fact, that the children were barely able to discern what appeared to be windows around the perimeter of the craft. They watched it circle above the school for several minutes. Realizing how strange it was, they shouted out for their teachers. Someone come quick! You gotta see this! The principal of the school, Rodney Warwick, heard the excited shouts of students. He exited out onto the fire escape and saw a large, silver, cigar-shaped object hovering motionless in the sky. I've never seen anything like it, or heard of anything like it. It was the most unusual sight I ever saw. No one was frightened, and the children considered it quite a lark. As Warwick observed the object, it would occasionally become so brilliant that he had to shield his eyes. He called Mrs. Dittmer to see the object. However, before she arrived, it suddenly darted away at tremendous speed, horizontally off into the distance. While Dittmer didn't see the object, she and the others did see something just as strange. As the thing departed, it emitted a trail of white spider web-like substance known as angel hair all around them, covering the whole school. The entire sky all around them was filled with the substance. Dittmer described it as... The most beautiful soft white-looking tufts, like cotton, slowly floating to the ground. The substance had long fibers, very much as if someone had taken strands of angel hair and pushed some of it in bunches towards the middle or end, leaving a trail of fibers attached to it. The material fell to the ground for the next 45 minutes. That's a long time. Several of the children picked up the pieces. What are the teachers doing? You're letting them pick up (laughs) UFO material? Go pick up the junk, honey. This is the 50s. They didn't know about radiation, right? Well. Several of the children picked up pieces of it and brought it to both Dittmer and Warwick for examination. Warwick said it looked and felt like asbestos. 
but it clearly wasn't asbestos. It fell in the form of long spider web-like strands and also balls of cotton. The long strands proved to be tough and could hardly be broken. While the substance remained in the ground once touched, it disappeared within a minute. Both Dittmer and Warwick noticed a curious feature. When the substance was touched only on one end of a strand, it would roll up into a ball and then disintegrate. Hmm. Says Dittmer, It was very fine and soft to touch. It did not stick to our hands, but when we held two ends and pulled, it stretched without tearing. Where it stretched, it had a shiny appearance. The part we held between our fingers very quickly seemed to go to nothing. However, we could roll it in between our fingers in a very, very tiny ball. In a short while, our hands had a green stain on them. I soon washed my hands in warm water, and the stain rinsed quickly off. After being rolled into the ball, the white substance turned gray and then would quickly dissolve. Rodney Warwick, after handling the milky white substance, also found his hands covered with the strange green color. He told Dittmer that he was going to leave it on his hands to see what would happen. <laughs> Back in those days. Good idea. Sure, yeah, that's just a different world. I guess we'll see. Maybe it'll melt off. Shortly later, his hands became clammy, sweated profusely, and the green color disappeared by itself after about a half hour. The substance, they soon learned, covered a three-mile area surrounding the school. Yeah, this is crazy. When we left the school, we noticed it clinging to the grass, flagpole, and some on the cars. I believe that the thing that impressed me even further was that we saw it as we drove for the three miles to Columbus Road. The telephone wires were completely woven shut. What? As if hands had carefully spread angel hair out very evenly. Not only this, but the telephone wire were connected to the electric wires on the other side of the road, so that it was like a very misty canopy over the road for three miles. That's pretty crazy. That's weird. That's insane, yeah. dude. Like, I mean, that that's like when you call the FBI in or something. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, when was this? 1953? Oh. I mean, that uh, could 54. be some sort of governmental experiment. Well, can, continue here. We'll see where it goes. Warwick did manage to retrieve a sample, which he gave to the editor of the Journal Tribune, who forwarded the sample to Air Force authorities at nearby Lockbourne AFB in Columbus, Ohio. Air Force Base. No response regarding the substance was ever received. That's, That's not weird. a surprise. That's weird because in our last episode, the Listener Stories episode, we covered the stories from Rickenbacker Air Force Base. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That's Lockbourne Air Force Base. Oh, really? I think there's a lot that goes on down there. It sounds like it. Interesting. We found a lot of corroborating stories down I there. Mean, it, this is back in the 50s. That's when it kind of leans to potential government stuff going on. Some activity, on. yeah. I mean, there's also cover-up. Doesn't necessarily mean they're the ones behind the... Well, maybe they collected something in the 50s, like mm-hmm. from this story, and then they... Sure. It was something... Who knows? So Angel Hair, if anybody's wondering out there, you might have heard it. We talked about it a little bit in our Sky Whale, Sky Creature episode, mm-hmm. The Living Skies. So Angel Hair, or... Silicious cotton is a sticky fibrous substance reported in connection with the UFO sightings or manifestations of the Virgin Mary. Oh, yeah. It has been described as being like a cobweb or a jelly. Remember the jelly one we talked about with those police officers who found it after seeing what looked like a parachute coming down? Like a blob. It was like a glowing purple thing. It is named for its similarity to fine hair or spider webs. And in some cases, the substance has been found to be the web threads of migrating spiders. Reports of angel hair say that it disintegrates or evaporates within a short time of forming. Angel hair is an important aspect of the UFO religion. I did not know there was one. Somehow that escaped me. <laughs> Rialism. Huh. Or realism. And one theory among ufologists is that it is created from, quote, ionized air sleeting off an electromagnetic field that surrounds a UFO. Oh. That's weird. Yeah. So is it intentional or is it like just the phenomenon of the craft? That's a good question. And obviously it doesn't happen in every UFO. Obviously. Inca- so you have to wonder, is this is this a certain kind of craft? Is it a certain kind of species? Is this a certain military project? From mana. this specific story, it seems intentional because that's a lot of material coming down. Unless it's an accident, like as insofar as a malfunction, which oh, is interesting. interesting. Uh, which is interesting. No, it's interesting because these <laughs> these things are not... Uh, <laughs> as a UFO engineer, let me just Extraterrestrials. Say, it just seems like a bit much... Well, if you believe that we've gotten anything from extraterrestrials, as far as like... It seemed like it covered the whole area, though, right? Three miles. It's a bit more than just like a 
you know, something that goes wrong with the craft and it spits them. I mean, who knows? Seemed, we don't know how that just seems like works. a spraying of an area, though. Maybe to, to have covered that much. Like, how large the the craft is, too. Well, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't three miles in circumference. Yeah, but John, if you have a nuclear submarine, right? And like, there's some sort of problem with the nuclear submarine. You might have a radiation spread of hundreds of miles. But this is a material. This isn't radiation or a sound wave or something. Right, but I'm just saying the technology. You can say a semi truck. A semi truck drives past and it poops out a little black cloud that ends up spanning. Yeah, I'm just but saying it's we not don't a know. Cloud. It's like a. It's a material. Yeah, but John, you're thinking Earth physics. I know. Here. I just think it seems a bit intentional to cover something that deeply without any oh, sort of obvious malfunction. No, no, it could be. I it was just, just seems the more likely scenario. Well, from an Earth perspective, yeah. why? Where do you get the idea that it's a malfunction from? Because it doesn't happen all the time. We don't know what the purpose would be. There's no way to know is what I'm saying. I don't know. I get your point. Like, it seems unlikely they it would- It just seems like a not not the likely answer. Right. It seems like it would be an intentional thing to do. Yeah, there's no, there's no way to know. But I know what you're saying. It's That seems more probable. That's all I'm that saying. it was an intentional thing. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Experiments? Who knows? There are other accounts of the spiderweb stuff that I was going to get into where there are people that had to physically cut themselves out of it. What? Because they got stuck in the fall of this angel hair stuff. Well, uh, even just the fact that there's other ones out there, it seems less likely that it's a malfunction. But if you think that there might be millions of visitations a year, but, they, but it seems like it was just during this time frame that this happened, right? Were the other ones recent, or were they? No, they're the- stretching they're back to se- the 1700s. There's examples of this stuff, and again, like a lot of it could be natural phenomena, like the spider web thing. That does happen where there's actual, you know, there are migrating spiders that drop these little parachute silk things, and you migrating get migrating spiders. Yeah, and you'll get these uh, giant fields of this these spider webs. You, you've seen it, maybe you've seen it before. I've seen it here, I think once. But you have basically these little strands coming out of the sky, but they're spiders that are basically jumping. What? So they migrate on the wind? On the wind. Sometimes it's a natural phenomenon. It just uh, looks similar? It looks similar, where you have a field covering this stuff, and you see it falling from the sky. But there are examples, like for one example, we did in the Sky Creature episode with those police officers who found that jelly stuff. Right, the jelly started off as angel hair, this kind of material. It's it's a fascinating phenomenon. I'll have a link more in detail about this sort of stuff if you're interested. I didn't know that there were stories of people having to cut themselves out of the... Yeah, that was the next one I was going to do. I call that one Sky Cylinder Spinning Supernatural Silk. Wow. That's a lot of S's. It was the strangest sight to ever grace the sky over Aloran, France. In the early afternoon of October 17th, 1952, according to one of the many witnesses, high school superintendent Jean Yves Prigent, there appeared a, quote, cottony cloud of strange shape. Above it, a narrow cylinder, apparently inclined at a 45 degree angle, was slowly moving in a straight line toward the southwest. Again, it's another one of those shapes. A sort of plume of white smoke was escaping from its upper end. In front of this, quote, cylinder were 30 smaller objects that, when viewed through opera glasses, which we all have a pair of, (laughs) proved to be red spheres, each surrounded by a yellow ring. These saucers moved in pairs, Prigent said, quote, following a broken path characterized in general by rapid and short zigzags. When two saucers drew away from one another, a whitish streak, like an electric arc, was produced between them. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like an energy source. Yeah. But this was only the beginning of the strangeness. A white hair-like substance rained down from all of the objects, wrapping itself around telephone wires, tree branches, and the roofs of houses. When observers picked up the material and rolled it into a ball, it turned into a gelatin-like substance and vanished. One man who had observed the episode from a bridge claimed the material fell on him and he was able to extract himself from it only by cutting his way clear, at which point the material collected itself and ascended. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? It ascended. This is one of the most famous stories involving the angel hair stuff. And this is a lot of people saw this. 1952, so this right. is in France. Close to the same time that we get the one we just read from uh, Ohio, right? Yeah, and it's funny because I didn't get this from the same book. I got this just looking into the angel hair phenomenon. But really? again, it's a superintendent, which I thought was weird. What a weird connection. And also, if you do check out this book, they all piggyback off each other like one story goes to the next in a different part of the country in a different part of the world but there's always something occurring it seems like it just seems to build off itself it's all, so it's all kind of where you said superintendent right yeah so the last one was a superintendent who saw this cigar shaped craft yeah and we just had another superintendent one the only story that i know of a uh, personally dad superintendent right? is dad's yeah. superintendent for chippewa high school where we live now 
right, in Doylestown, right? Mm-hmm. That superintendent for Chippewa High School was having a little cocktail party, a little gathering. And at one point, the superintendent goes to the bathroom of the kitchen, looks out the window and sees a cigar-shaped object. Was it cigar-shaped? Yes, a cigar-shaped That's object. That's crazy. Hovering over the, what is it with superintendents and cigar-shaped objects? Uh, UFOs in Marysville, Ohio. Maybe that's near, I don't know, maybe it was the same craft. Uh, it could be around a little later probably for dad, but maybe. I don't know, it's interesting. That is interesting. Maybe not. I mean, dad started teaching in what, the 70s, 60s, 70s? There was an account I was reading later that comes from Australia also references, one person referenced that it was cigar shaped. Well, yeah, that's such a common thing. It was schools though. It seems like a specifically with schools kind of. Right. And John, maybe there's something to what you're saying about the intentionality of it. Because if you look at these last two stories, they were both the same sort of craft. They were dropping the same stuff. Uh-huh. So maybe there is some sort of purpose behind it. Yeah, and in this time frame of the 50s, it seems it was happening a lot. So maybe it was... Maybe they were inseminating. Yeah, what if they're a species? They were seeding the planet. Maybe. Maybe they're sky whales. Although the window thing, it just it reminds me of like the Betty and Barney Hill thing where there are windows you see inside. Oh yeah, that is bizarre. Anyways, interesting. There, There's so much in this book. There's so much out there, guys. There's so much out there in, in our vastness of the universe. Yeah, if you guys want more specifically schoolyard UFO encounter stories, definitely check out this book. It'll be in the show notes. Just was a really great aggregation of all these kinds of stories. Yeah. If, if you are someone who's interested in researching more into this phenomena. Interesting stuff. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe we'll do another one down the road. I mean, there's plenty to come. We only did a few and there's plenty more. We'll definitely be going back out for recess sometime. I'll tell you that. That is terrible. Yeah. (laughs) So we're going to explore more of these stories maybe in the future. I do like the theme type Mm -hmm. stories, right? Well, this guy does a good job with that. Um, Preston Dennett. His other books are interesting and they kind of remind me of episodes we do because... Oh yeah, some of these are great. We should definitely do. He is not from here, volume one through three at least. And the chapters are like, to air as alien. And it's kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, ETs are clearly more advanced than humans, but they are not perfect. Sometimes they make stupid mistakes. And he had a whole chapter on every time something went wrong. Every time, like, they made a mistake, you know. It reminds me of the men in black idea where, like. Right. Not quite sure how to eat food. Not from here. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, they may be advanced in certain ways, whatever these entities are, these things, but they can't quite get things right. So it's kind of cool to focus on those stories. I think that'd be an interesting episode to do. Yeah, I'd definitely like to check out the more gaps, of The gaps, if you will. The gaps. The gaps of the ETs or whatever they are. Anyway, uh, let us know what you guys think about this episode. Uh, that was a lot of fun. There's definitely more stories to get That's into. a lot of fun. Do you? Yes. But sometimes you just sound so milk toast. Guys, it was a lot of fun. Maybe you should come join him with for some milk. Well, you end it. You say what you want, John. No, that was great. That was some, there were some fascinating accounts. Thank you guys so much for being here. Absolutely. Hope you enjoyed this topic. There is so much weirdness out there. and I mean, that's the thing. I think a lot of our listeners would agree with this. The path to discovery is the fun part to some of the stuff. Yeah, for where, sure. where it's the mystery, where it's less of a threat of the unknown. Yeah, but right. more like, I want mystery in life. That's one of the reasons we do this show. To have every mystery solved would make life boring. Yeah, and I don't think that's ever going to happen. No, I just think there's something built into life. That, exactly. At least in this physical plane, wherever, why we're here, there's always going to be unknown. There's a reason, yeah. I think, why it, this goes into a lot of like Keel stuff, a lot of Jacques Vallée stuff, but the idea that there are reasons why you get blurry photos all the time. There are reasons why you, your camera doesn't seem to work in certain situations. There are reasons why these things... Is there a phenomenon name? There, I mean, there's ultra-terrestrial is something that's been thrown out, the idea that... Ultra-terrestrial. Where like, you have this consciousness that's aware of itself, this sort of meta version of a paranormal like God? entity. Uh, maybe like a more more on the trickster paranormal side of it, like whether it's aliens or Bigfoot or, oh, okay. or UFOs like or a phenomenon. Mothman. Well, you're not allowed to see Ghosts. too clearly. Right? right, there seems to be, if not an alliance, an overarching intelligence that just keeps you from, just enough to wet your whistle, to wonder what's going on, but not enough to ever really let you it know what's happening. It seems to be a feature of our reality. Yeah. Yes, it does. That, that we programmed in Even maybe. like synchronicity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother thing. And that's a, that's a mind-bending phenomenon. And even if the purpose of that is just to bend your mind, is just to, yeah. to tweak that curiosity about life and the mystery of life and to keep you Excited. keep you constantly awake to the right. idea that this reality There's is special. More. Especially in the age of heavy materialism, it's important to have that stimulation that you just got to look up in the sky. It's the spaces in between. So on that note, put your phone down, go outside for a walk and talk to people and connect with your humanity. And then come back and subscribe to Believe. And smash <laughs> that like button. <laughs> and smash the like button. Stay with us forever in the hole. But take your breaks. Take but, your human breaks. Seriously, get out there and just yeah. experiment with the with reality, which we don't do anymore. Just be by yourself. Just enjoy some... Go on a walk. Enjoy some trees. With silence. It's just walking yeah. in the woods. Just as scary as it might be for a little bit, just give it a shot and see what it's like. You might hear a voice. Luckily, you I think a lot of our sign. listeners are tuned into that concept. I think we probably have a lot of people that are a little more it still takes, aware of it everything. It still takes some push. I mean, for me, it's... Yeah. The, you know. No, for sure. Just another helpful reminder. Yeah. To be human. 
Another helpful reminder from us, your friends, at the Belief Hole. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> the more you know. The more you know. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Well, hold on. I'm not ready to leave yet. Oh, sorry. Well, you just, that was very abrupt. John, you've had some in your mouth like the last hour. <laughs> Everyone on the show is going to be like, swallow it. Did you hear it? I like how you yell at me for having <laughs> snacks in here. I'm sorry. You're literally eating on the microphone. I won't do that anymore. So what did you want to say, John? No, that's it. Okay, great. It just shocked me that we moved that quickly to the end. Okay, now we can go. Guys, thanks so much for being here. And we'll see you. We'll see you. Are we ready this time? We'll see you next I time. I want to do it. I don't want to do the belief All right. hole. <laughs> hey, guys, we'll see you next time on the show. Thanks for coming. All right, see you Take later. Take it to Topity 2. Yowza! Yowza! The belief hole.